Sure. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate it. And would like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone. Um, obviously, we love to do these things in person, but hey, we'll take what we can get. I hope many of you are staying safe out there wherever you are. Um, I'm enjoying some evening coffee, and I hope you're doing the same. So um, we like to keep this as informal as possible, um, and hopefully you'll get a lot out of this. And this is one of my favorite topics to talk about, and that's essential tremor and advanced treatment options for essential tremor. So we'll talk about that as well as some pearls along the way that I think would be beneficial. All right. So let's talk about how to live your best life with DBS therapy. And first, before we get started, I'm going to have you listen to Keith and Keith's story. So let's listen to him. My name's Keith. I have essential tremors. I work in orthopedics. Before my tremor started, I used to go into the operating room, help with surgical procedures, and unfortunately, I'm not able to do that anymore. Well, the first time I started noticing the symptoms, um, I was a sophomore in college, played a lot of basketball, I was really active, I'd go out and do a lot of running. Once the tremor started, um, started progressing, you could just see everything just starting to decline a little bit. All right, so that's a little bit about Keith's story. So kind of gives you an intro there. And remember, he's he's one of you. So he's a he's a patient, but uniquely he's also in the healthcare field. Um, and so we'll get to hear more from Keith in a little bit. But first let's have a little background. So essential tremor is something that you may not realize it until you've heard about it, but it is everywhere. It's all around you. Chances are if you go to the mall or a football game or really any place in public, you'll, you'll see someone with essential tremor. So what a tremor is, it's an involuntary rhythmic movement of a part of the body. That could be any part. It could be the voice, head. It could be the hands or the or the legs, it can even be inside you, an internal tremor as we call it, not observable with the naked eye, but you can feel it. And uh, used to, I used to use the um, example of Katherine Hepburn as she had essential tremor. And now as we teach medical students and residents, no one knows who Katherine Hepburn is. So I need new ideas um, on how to teach them about that. But it's very common, been around for a long time, but thankfully, we're blessed that technology has allowed us to do even more in terms of treatment for essential tremor. And this is contrasted with a resting tremor that you would typically think about in Parkinson's disease. Instead, this is what we call an action tremor. So when I go to do something, that's when I'm going to notice the tremor. And there's a back part of your brain called the cerebellum. And for those of you who have ever had a little too much beer or wine, perhaps, and you feel like you're clumsy or not as coordinated as you should be. Um, that is because the cerebellum, which controls balance and coordination, is temporarily impaired. But in an essential tremor, it's that cerebellum and the brain working together that's thought to cause most of the essential tremor. And it's one of the most common causes of essential tremor. So you've heard me say already, it's everywhere, 10 times more frequent than Parkinson's disease, yet what you typically hear about in the news or in the press is Parkinson's, which is great. We love awareness of Parkinson's and other movement disorders, but essential tremor is something that far more common. One million people um, have PD in the United States versus about 10 million with essential tremor in the United States. And about half of those have a family history of essential tremor. So not everybody has a family history, but many folks who have a family history of essential tremor They'll, they'll notice their dad had tremor or mom had tremor, maybe even sons and daughters perhaps who have tremor. So what does it look like? Well, we talked a little bit about action tremor. So it, it, goes, it, it comes on when I go to do something, eating, drinking, riding, sometimes even talking. And this is different than a tremor that you get if you're nervous or anxious about something. This is a tremor that is action in nature. 
Um, also, postural in nature. So what that means is if I'm holding something like a newspaper, let's say, or something like that, or if I'm holding a plate at the buffet line or whatever the case may be and I start tremoring, that's called a postural tremor. So essential tremor affects not only the moving part of it, the action part of it, but also when you're holding something that's called postural. So let's look at some examples, and maybe this hits home with some of you. So let's look at this. So this gentleman is writing, today is a sunny day, and you can imagine how difficult it is for him. Um, he is struggling even to write a simple sentence, and, um, and that it could be less than that, it could be more than that. Imagine if it's the end of the day or he's super fatigued or very anxious or nervous, that tremor gets worse. So keep in mind that any movement disorder gets worse the more anxious or nervous that we are. Let's look at another example. So this gentleman is, is drinking from a coffee cup and compensating because he's able to use that other hand, but imagine if he if that cup was full of hot coffee um, or something like that. Imagine if he was in public and it would be all over the place in some cases. And so you can imagine how isolating that must feel for him. And then here is a, um, another example of tremor. To both hands, my throat and my feet. This is the cup I drink out of all day long, maybe. <laughs> I can steady it with two hands, but not with one. I am left-handed, so my left hand is more dramatic than my right. There's a little tremor in the right, but it's very dramatic. So you can see there that she's compensated nicely because she has a cup, she has a straw, she has a lid. Um, so that kind of takes care of some things spilling, but you can see there that one hand or one side is more affected than the other, and that's very common in essential tremor. Um, you can also, if you're paying careful attention, you can also hear a little bit of tremor in her voice, and so that's very common with essential tremor. So other things, you know, when I see patients in clinic, they're very concerned. Hey, Dr. Swallow, let's make sure I don't have Parkinson's. I don't have Parkinson's, do I? Um, and when I asked them why they're nervous about that diagnosis, they said, well, it changes with time. It gets worse with time. Well, keep in mind that essential tremor may also get worse with time. But again, the blessing in disguise here is that regardless of the diagnosis, whether it's Parkinson's disease or it's essential tremor, we have excellent treatment options for that. So for essential tremor, we really don't know what causes it, although as you heard me say, about half of folks who have essential tremor also have a genetic risk factor to that. It is most common um, in patients who are older than 65, although not uncommonly we'll see it in patients who are younger. Even kiddos can have tremor. And it also is responsive to alcohol sometimes. So you, you, if you've been to a neurologist or a movement disorder specialist in the past, they may have asked you if you have a beer or a glass of wine, if your tremor gets better, and they're not being intrusive. It's simply because the way essential tremor is, alcohol can sometimes make that better. And in the older days, they, doctors and, and um, medical professionals used to actually test that and, as part of the diagnosis and, and have patients have a glass of wine or, or a beer. And imagine what that would do uh, in this day and age, huh? That would be fun going to the doctor. Uh, but as you heard me say, essential tremor affects everywhere, or it can affect everywhere. So it can affect the hands, legs, voice, head. And typically, your medical team will use a rating scale to help identify the tremor and to see where it is most severe. Because if we know where it's most severe or where it's troublesome to you, that helps guide our treatment options for you. And speaking of, we have many treatment options for essential tremor. And I always pause here to tell a story. I, I hardly ever give my card out in public and mostly because my wife kills me if I do and is so embarrassed. Um, but I was in a large 
hardware store at one point in time, and I saw a gentleman who was working there, and of all sections, the screw section, the nuts and bolts and screws, very fine screws, and he was trying to restock the shelves, but he had essential trimmer, and so as he was trying to put up all these screws in their bins, he dropped the screws, screws went everywhere, and I went over to help him, and he goes, I am so sorry, my trimmer is getting in the way of this, and I couldn't help myself, and my wife says, oh my gosh, what is, what is my husband doing? And I shared information about Essential Trimmer with him, gave him my card, and most importantly, I said, you know, it breaks my heart to see this. I, I hope you know this is treated um, and treatable. And he said, are you kidding me? I thought I was born this way. I never realized there were, was treatment. I've just always had a trimmer, and I thought that's the way I was born, and that's the way it is. And as I said, a lot of it is education, but I know I'm preaching to the choir because all of you are on here today learning all about trimmer. But um, my hope is that you will hear this presentation, and for those of you who know someone with trimmer or maybe even have trimmer, that you will spread the word that this is a treatable condition. And so how do we do that? Well, first and foremost, we have medication that we can use to treat trimmer if it's problematic or troublesome to you. The first two medicines that we use are the two Ps. One's called propranolol, and the other one's called primidone. So you may have heard propranolol in the past because it's often used by our primary care colleagues to treat high blood pressure, but we also use it to block adrenaline so that tremor is not as problematic. Primidone is an old seizure medicine that we hardly ever use for seizures anymore, but we use all the time for tremor. And uh, those are our two first-line medicines. We usually use one or the other, but most of the time we need to use more than one medicine when we're treating tremor, and sometimes we'll use both together as long as um, it's appropriate for the patient to do that. There are other medicines that we also use to treat tremor, most of which are used for different purposes, as is frequently the case in neurology. And so you can see that gabapentin or topiramate, those are two popular medicines that are used for other purposes in neurology, but we can also take advantage because it often works for tremor. And my rule of thumb is, is a patient has tried and failed at least two medicines, and either they, number one, didn't get good efficacy, which means benefit, or number two, they take the medicine, but it just makes them too sleepy or too dizzy or they just don't feel good on the medicine, then we need to start thinking about other options. And I'll tell you as well that um, as a movement disorder specialist, we see folks all the time who feel like they've tried medicines and it didn't work or they didn't tolerate it. But I'll tell you, there is an art to starting these medicines and how your doctor or team starts the medicine is very important. We have to start low and go slow and give your brain chemistry time to kind of um, get used to these medicines. And so oftentimes we can restart a medicine that someone was previously um, tried and they will tolerate the medicine simply because of how we're able to restart the medicine. Low and slow wins the race. And so um, as you heard me say already, a lot of times we'll have to use more than one medicine in combination for trimmer. Now, as you heard me say, we're blessed that we have other treatment options too. So what if the medicine is not doing the trick? What do we do? Well, in the older days, we used to do what's called lesioning, where we would go into the brain with um, an electrode a little bit bigger than the wire on your mouth that you're probably using right now. And um, we would go into the brain and we would make a scar. And that was perfect. It, it worked great for trimmer. The problem is, is this trimmer gets worse and worse, or if it gets worse and worse throughout a patient's life, we can't go in and make that scar bigger and bigger and bigger. So we were kind of limited, so to speak. New kit on the block is high frequency focused ultrasound, which is an excellent treatment option for tremor as well. The thing there is it's usually indicated for one side of the body. And sometimes when we have a tremor, we have to use both sides of the body, or both sides of the brain, I should say, in order to capture or control that tremor. So that wouldn't be a good option for those folks. But then deep brain stimulation takes advantage of both of those and says, okay, well, how can we put that same electrode in the brain, uh, very small 
electrode and how can we jam that signal but still have the ability to reverse it along the way or change the settings as time changes. So as tremor worsens, we can accommodate that by changing the or adjusting the settings. We can do it on one side, we can do it on both sides. And this is not the new kit on the block. This has been around since the late 90s, and, uh, or even early 90s, I should say, and um, it's been used for quite some time, but yet I'm amazed at how many people have never heard about deep brain stimulation. But again, we're gonna talk about that at length today. So another important aspect of tremor, especially with diagnosing tremor, is making sure that the medical team is taking a really good look at the meds that you're already taking. It's not uncommon for our patients these days, unfortunately, to be taking 20, sometimes 30 medicines. And so all of those may not play nicely with each other. Some of them can actually lead to worsening tremor. I would say the top two culprits that we typically see are antiarrhythmics that maybe a cardiologist or a primary care doctor may use for arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation. Sometimes even antidepressants and mood stabilizers can also cause tremor as well. And it doesn't mean that you can't be on those medicines. It doesn't mean that those aren't appropriate for you. It just means that we have to make sure we're taking that into account when we're diagnosing tremor. And then sometimes it's not essential tremor. Sometimes it's actually Parkinson disease. And that's important to be seen by a movement disorder specialist so that they can help distinguish between is this Parkinson's or is this essential tremor? And again, all of you will be experts too by the time this is over because we're gonna talk about that. So there's not a known medical or genetic test for us to confirm the diagnosis of essential tremor. So we can't just take a swab and say, aha, you've got this versus this. It's not that easy. But what we do is we use your history and your physical exam and other people's observation of you. And I often tell patients, this is kind of like watching a snow globe. So if you shake up a snow globe, you can't really see through all the snow, but as that dust settles or snow settles, you can start to see what the picture is. And the same is true in the brain with tremor disorders. Sometimes it may look like one disorder, but as time goes on, we're able to kind of hone in on the actual diagnosis. And your doctors or, or team may have you do weird things like handwriting and spirals, as you see there, maybe even pour out liquid or pretend like you're drinking or eating with a spoon. We do all of those things. Um, I even have a patient that has um, essential tremor who loves to play golf. And so every time we tune his the brain stimulator, he brings in his golf club and we're able to make adjustments based on how his tremor is as he addresses the golf ball. But you can see here on your left that there is a nice, beautiful, simple spiral with no squiggles or wiggles, and that's no tremor. And then you can see that in the middle there is a very shrunken down spiral, very small, and that is from Parkinson's disease. So when you lose dopamine in your brain as it results in Parkinson's, then everything gets smaller and quieter, including your handwriting. And then if you look on the right, you can see essential tremor. And those are the classic sinusoidal spirals of essential tremor, pretty classic wiggle or squiggle, if you will. And so those are some of the tools that we use for diagnosis. And I love this slide because it kind of gives us a nice comparison between what everyone's worried about, the elephant in the room. Is it Parkinson's disease or is it essential tremor? And remember that essential tremor can affect really anywhere can affect the head and the voice inside you, your arms and legs. And Parkinson's disease, you can also get tremor in the head, for example, but most of the time it's the tongue instead of the chin or the jaw. Um, again, Parkinson's disease can have a mixture of essential tremor as well. So that's why there are certain questions and, and aspects of your neurological exam that the team uses in order to hone in on the correct diagnosis. Most often with essential tremor, there's a strong family history. About half of the folks with essential tremor have family history. Again, not always. And alcohol, as it quiets down the brain, can also affect essential tremor. Not always the case with Parkinson's. Now, the tremor type is perhaps one of the biggest distinguishing characteristics between the two. 
So remember that essential tremor has a tremor when you go to do something, when I'm going to write, when I'm going to touch a screwdriver into a screw and turn, that's when my tremor is going to act up. And that is pretty classic with the essential tremor, as opposed to Parkinson's disease, which is a tremor most commonly seen when you're at rest. So when you're not moving, you're not doing anything, hands are in your lap, you're watching TV, and then there's a tremor mostly at rest. That's much more commonly see, seen with Parkinson's disease. But when we're testing for that, we have to make sure the patient is truly at rest. Because if, as those of you with essential tremor know, if you move your thumb or fingers even just a little bit, it'll start twitching. Uh, and that's pretty common with essential tremor. And sometimes if we still don't know, or it's still hard, to tell the difference. Even those of us that do this every day, sometimes it's not black or white. There's some gray in there. We can do a trial of levodopa and in Parkinson's disease, that's a medicine that gives you back your dopamine that you've lost in Parkinson's and it can be very beneficial in Parkinson's disease, but not as much in essential tremor. And then there are even imaging studies that we can sometimes do that they would be abnormal in Parkinson's and normal in the essential tremor. Again, we don't have to do that very often, but sometimes we use that and it can be very it's helpful. So what do we do about managing essential tremor? So the goal is to reduce the tremor severity, as you heard me say, so we diagnose it first and foremost. The second thing we do is we ask the patient, is it troublesome to you? Are you bothered by the tremor? If you are, then we treat it. And I always pause here to remind patients that you have to be careful not to compare it to other people. So I hear patients all the time say, well, Dr. Swallow, I saw someone in your waiting room and their tremor was a lot worse than mine, so I don't need to take a medicine. And then I ask them, well, does it prevent you from doing something that you love to do? Well, sure it does. I never even sing in choir anymore because my tremor is so bothersome. Well, the key is if it's problematic to you, we treat it, okay, bottom line. And so um, just know that we can do that. And then if it is bothersome, we can treat it as we've already discussed. And then if the meds aren't working or you're not tolerating it, then we have deep brain stimulation. And again, we'll talk more about that. So let's come back to Keith and hear more about his story. It's Keith. I have essential tremors. I work in orthopedics. Before my tremor started, I used to go into the operating room, help with surgical procedures, and unfortunately, I'm not able to do that anymore. Well, the first time I started noticing the symptoms, um, I was a sophomore in college, played a lot of basketball. I was really active. I'd go out and do a lot of running. Once the tremor started, um, started progressing, you could just see everything just starting to decline a little bit. I decided to get the procedure done because you can't do anything. You can't eat, you can't write. Every time you pick up a glass of water, it's all over the floor. Or you try feeding yourself and you got food all over the table. You know, you kind of start isolating. Don't go out to dinner, um, you know, because you're just paranoid you're going to make a fool out of yourself. No, it was time. You think there's no way anyone is going to be drilling a hole in my head and putting an electrode in there. Well, I got it done. And it's the best thing I ever did. That part, the part I was most scared to death with, the whole drilling didn't even feel it. It was nothing like I was thinking it to be. The procedure itself was easy. The surgeon that I went to, uh, he basically gave me some options and the Abbott DBS system is the one that we thought was gonna work the best for me. After I had my procedure, they brought me up to the ICU and I picked up a glass of water and it just went like this and I'm just going, oh, it's gone. It's absolutely gone. Then I'm just thinking, 
why the heck did I wait so long? My surgery was November 30th. I was out three weeks and went back to work 100% normal. Since I had the procedure done, I don't take any medication. It's mind-blowing. And this DBS system absolutely did what I wanted it to do. I can write, I can eat, I can drink, I can do whatever I want. You're not self-conscious anymore. You go in for two program settings, four or five weeks after my surgery date. Met with a nurse practitioner and um, she went through the whole programming cycle and she set a range from 1.50 being the minimum up to 2.0 and I can actually control the device with, with an iPod. It prompts you on exactly what you have to do and then when you're done with how you want it set, you just turn it off, put the iPod in your pocket and away you go. My plans uh, for the future are to get my other side done, to get the same results that I had with my right side and in terms of my work to get back in the operating room. I think what I would tell people if they were considering to have this done is, I was just like you. I know you're anxious, scared. You just wake up one morning and say, let's go, I gotta get it done. You'll know when to get it done. I'd recommend this to anybody. Bring them in, I'll, I'll tell them what it's like. It's amazing how it changed my life. It's a miracle. Definitely 100% worth it. This testimonial relates an account of an individual's response to the treatment. This patient's account is genuine, typical, and documented. However, it does not provide any indication, guide, warranty, or guarantee as to the response other persons may have to the treatment. Responses to the treatment discussed can and do vary and are specific to the individual patient. There is no cure for part. And so what I love about Keith's video is, number one, again, this is real life. I cannot tell you verbatim how many times I've heard patients with those same concerns, those same things. Um, I wrote down a few uh, that I hear over and over again as, as if it was a broken record, uh, which is great because it gives us the opportunity to talk about it. But um, nobody's going to touch my head. How would I have anything, any procedure done drilling a hole, quote unquote. Um, another thing, I had the procedure done, I was scared beforehand about that, but then after, I realized that that wasn't even the part, I didn't have to be scared about that. It wasn't even the part I was worried about um, after the fact. Um, another thing I hear all the time, why wait? Um, I can't believe I didn't do this sooner. That is probably the number one thing that we hear. You saw at one point him get out his control, his iPod, and actually change the settings of his device. And one thing that we really try to empathize with our patients on is essential tremor takes away or robs you of the control you have for doing your day-to-day -day things you love to do, fishing, golfing, eating, drinking, riding. Um, and so with these remotes, uh, and with a DBS system, you're able to adjust that yourself as needed um, in order to get that control back. And then lastly, you'll know when it's time, I, I guarantee you no one comes into my office saying, hey, sign me up for deep brain stimulation. Um, they, they hardly ever want that at first. And then the more we talk about it, the, the, the more they talk to other patients, the more familiar they get with the therapy, or if they know someone else that's had it done, um, then they we start introducing that idea and then that treatment. So again, I love Keith's video. Uh, really, that's the star of the show tonight, in my opinion, is is Keith's video because it's 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 real. So as you heard me say, DBS is not new. 
Um, even in the 30s all the way to the 60s, there were things done that showed that stimulating the brain could change how we respond, how our bodies respond. And then in the 90s, deep brain stimulation got FDA approval. And then in 2015, we had regulatory approval for a directional DBS system, which we'll talk about. So how DBS works is kind of a really tough thing to explain because we don't really understand it completely yet, despite how old it is. Um, but basically the way I describe it to my patients is what we try to do is jam the signal in the brain that's not working right, that's causing an imbalance of movement, a lack of coordination. Again, that cerebellum in the back of the brain is not working correctly. But by changing the output, if you will, by stimulation, we're able to restore a balance. And again, the important thing here is it's programmable and it's adjustable. And not only do you get the control back, not only can you adjust it, not only can we, your medical team, uh, adjust your DBS, it doesn't just help you immediately, it helps you long term. And so we know through several studies now that DBS can last 10 or more years and give um, good control to tremor. And again, that's one thing that's great about it is as tremor progresses with time, we can accommodate that progression by adjusting your DBS with time. So let, let's look at some other examples here. Now you've seen this before, so let me see here. Let's watch this. So remember, this is the, the gentleman that had trouble riding. Today is a sunny day. And then this gentleman, difficulty with drinking his coffee cup. So remember these folks? We saw them earlier. To both hands, my throat, and my feet. This. So those are the folks we met earlier. Now let's watch these videos again, but this time on simulation, with deep brain stimulation. So I want you to notice how fluid his writing is now. So different from previous. The funny thing that I notice here, you can see the comparison. Uh, we don't prompt patients to put exclamation points when they do before and afters, but everyone does it. And I find that fascinating. And it shows how excited they are. So watch this guy turn on his DBS, look at his right hand, tremor, tremor, gone. And it's no longer difficult. And he can drink his coffee just fine. Again, not magic. This stuff has been around for quite some time. Okay. So it's turned back on now. You can see how easy that was. <clears throat> Let me just get a hold of this. Dramatic change. I can actually pick it up with one hand and not impale myself with a straw. Still shakes a little bit, but nothing compared to what it was. Coffee cup. Up to the mouth, back down. So you can see there that that, that is something that the befores and afters it almost looks too good to be true, um, but that is exactly why I became a movement disorder specialist, is it allowed me to, um, to do something about a condition that we can't really cure just yet, and, um, but we can dramatically change lives, and that's why I became a movement disorder specialist. So as you heard me say, there is some stimulators, um, very small electrodes, a little bit bigger, uh, or about the same size, actually, as, as the mouse uh, that you're probably using if you're using a computer. And those go deep into the brain and deliver a signal or a stimulation that's set by your medical team. And that changes the output of your brain, basically restores the balance once it's tuned in, if you will. And then we're able to change what happens to the body. 
And there are many aspects of that that, that it takes to, to do such great things. So uh, some things I'll show you here. Um, first of all, the big tablet, the iPad that you see there, that is what your doctors and medical team will use to control your settings. Uh, you saw many patients already use an iPod, very familiar technology, Apple products to, to most of us, and they are able to adjust their settings as they see fit. Most of you who have a central trimmer know that you will have good days and you will have bad days, and some days are just worse than others. So imagine an opportunity on those bad days to say, oh, let me just fine tune it a little bit, and your doctor sets that, those settings, so don't worry. Um, and don't worry, uh, patient, um, your loved ones or spouses don't get full reign of the controls to crank it up, um, although they want to at times, I'm sure. Um, the other thing that's very important is the battery pack that gives all of this juice, so to speak. And that is always implanted underneath the skin. It's all an internal system. You don't see this from the outside, and that's what allows everything to work correctly. And I always get asked, well, doctor, how, how do you make sure nothing's moving around up there? Well, there are these fancy locks that go on there that kind of sit flush or a little, a little um, close to the skull there that keep everything locked in in place. And when you talk about the worst part of these procedures to have this done, as you heard Keith say, it's not necessarily the procedure itself but it's the fear of the unknown. It's the, the, the road to the procedure and the roller coaster ride emotionally that folks take. And this is why in my clinic I have a rule that you can't say yes or no to any procedure that we offer unless you've spoken with other patients that have laid there, been there, and done that. I've never had brain surgery before, but I have many patients who say, here is my number, I want to talk to somebody, and, um, and that's how most patients get a lot of information these days. Now, let's talk about the procedure a little bit. You've heard parts of it. So the cool thing about this surgery from the tech, for the technology geeks out there like me is that there is a lot of fancy technology and software to plan for this procedure. And we use a combination of imaging and several other things because every person's anatomy is unique in and of itself, and so we use your own anatomy, a 3D rendering of your brain so that we can hit certain structures and avoid certain structures. That's what makes the risk of things like bleeding and other complications incredibly low. Um, one to three percent typically is because we have such good technology that we leverage these days in order to do this. When we implant the lead, as you heard, heard Keith say, most of the time patients stay just overnight in the hospital. They go home the next day. Most of our patients that have this procedure done are by far the most well patients in the ICU. And they go home the next day. They, um, during the procedure, how do we know we're in the right place? And one thing I tell patients is, it's my job and the surgeon's job to make sure that it's not just taking care of your tremor right now, but for the next 10 years, so 10 years from now, I wanna make sure that we're in a great spot big window, lots of wiggle room to go up and down on this device. And then once we like what we see, we secure the leading close. And then the patient will come back about a week or so later, at least in our clinic, um, and they will get their second stage, which is just an outpatient procedure where they get their battery placed and they go home the same day. That's a same day procedure. Um, and then, as you heard Keith allude, about three to five weeks after your initial surgery, having a the chance to allow the brain to settle down a bit. We're able to actually program the device uh, in our clinic with the remotes, and that's the fun part. That's the part that family members love to see, and we really get that in the ballpark and optimize that trimmer. And I always remind patients, this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. The trimmer didn't get like this overnight. Um, it's not going to be magically cured overnight either, but it does take a lot of um, uh, tweaking and adjusting, but most of the time patients will leave our office with dramatic differences. So DBS is not always for all patients. There are certain things that make you a good candidate, and maybe DBS may not be the best procedure for some folks. 
um, it's always important to talk to your medical team on whether or not you're a good candidate. And um, if you're having tremor, uh, especially in the upper extremities, and it's beginning to frustrate you more, it's impacting your day-to-day -day activity, um, that's the time to start thinking about deep brain stimulation. This is not a last resort. In fact, we know that if we do this early, it can be better. Um, medications also helped with, if medications have helped with your symptoms, but just isn't doing the trick, DBS may be for you. If you have not a whole lot of cognitive issues, let's say, um, I don't mean walking into a room and forgetting what you went in there for. I have a four and a half and a three-year-old. I do that every single day of my life. What I mean are big things with cognition. Uh, you and your family will know it. Um, we may ought to think about other things, perhaps, uh, other procedures that can help your tremor. Um, but if you don't have that and you talk to your doctors and they feel like it, you're a good candidate, then it's important for you to um, keep learning about deep brain stimulation and to ask other patients, go attend a support group, um, use your resources like the IETF, International Essential Tremor Foundation. Those things are really helpful for our patients. And if we do see a side effect like pulling or slurred speech or something like that that's temporary because of how we have them programmed, the beauty of DBS is we can actually adjust, in most cases, out of that side effect. So the way I explain this to patients is if you imagine throwing a pebble into a pond and the wave that it makes, the ripples as it goes out, that's what it's essentially doing with the stimulation. And now with Abbott's technology, we're able to change the direction of that stimulation and actually point it to where we want it to go and keep it from going where we don't want it to go. So very cool therapy. And uh, that's called directional lead. So let's look at that a little bit. Let me explain what you saw there. So what you see on your screen is an electrode. Obviously, this is blown up for uh, illustration purposes. The actual electrode is way smaller than that. But what you're seeing in red, um, the different aspects of, that it showed, is where we have the ability to stimulate within that structure itself. Most of the time, it's the thalamus in the brain, just a part of the brain that controls tremor. So if we like what we see, we're good, we can leave those settings right there. But what if the stimulation's creeping over to the part that affects speech, causing a little bit of slurred speech? Well, we can change or steer that and point that stimulation in a different direction. And that allows us to avoid the speech part, but still maintain tremor control. Again, mind-blowing stuff. And we're able to do that day in and day out to help these patients uh, limit their side effects. So with Abbott's bilateral labeling, it's the only FDA-approved bilateral or unilateral VIM, uh, VIM indication for essential tremor. So basically what that means is that in deep brain stimulation, we're able to do both sides of the brain to control tremor in the, in the arms. And it's also been shown to help people get back to their activities of daily living, and um, that includes things like handwriting, pouring a drink, people using their hands to piddle around the house. Those are all things that we take for granted, but those who have essential tremor struggle with even the most simple things. You heard Keith, again, going back to Keith, powerful video, you heard him say that even in healthcare, he never went out to eat uh, because he was scared that he would make a fool of himself or spill things. And no one wants to be that person, right? No one wants to have everyone make a scene in public. So it can be socially isolating. And then you find yourself not doing the activities you love simply because you want to avoid it. So again, DBS can, can help improve those aspects where you're not having to necessarily do that. And of course, treat tremor. So here you have an opportunity if medications haven't helped you and you're still having tremor, 
it's a great opportunity to talk to your medical team about deep brain stimulation, and in particular with the steering mechanism, Abbott's DBS system. And the thing I love about this is it's technology that you're able to use um, that you're already familiar with, so Apple technology, and that also helps send out updates wirelessly as things are improved. And trust me, every single year we've seen drastic improvements in technology. So um, for that reason, uh, Abbott's chosen by many professionals around the country um, to help with deep brain stimulation. And oftentimes I get, a, I get questions from my patients about, well, Dr. Swallow, I've watched these videos. Those are amazing. And hey, that sounds great, but I can't afford a surgery. And you know, we, we're just really trying to make ends meet especially right now with everything that's gone on recently. But remember, this has been around for quite some time. It's considered standard of care, and um, most insurances, if not all insurances, cover this. You know, sometimes we, as doctors, have to write letters to the insurance companies, making sure that they understand your need for them, but, um, but this is a covered benefit under most plans. And again, your doctor can help you understand if, if this is a, a covered benefit, or your insurance company can help you understand if this is a covered benefit for you. So let's say you've heard something and you say, you know, at the very least, I need to find out more information about this. Where do I start? Well, there's not a movement disorder specialist on every corner in most places. So um, one of the best resources I would encourage you to use is at the bottom there, finddbsclinic.com. So importantly, as you heard Keith say, you wanna make sure you go to someone that has good experience. Um, this is not their first time doing deep brain stimulation. Um, you wanna make sure that you go to a team, movement disorder specialist and a surgeon who's comfortable and familiar with this procedure. Um, again, this is, um, this is something they do day in and day out. If you don't have that luxury of a movement disorder team, by all means, go to your neurologist and express your interest and ask questions. But if you're not getting the answers you need, remember, be your own advocate, talk to um, other patients, and use your resources, including what you find online. Now, as you heard me say earlier, basically any procedure has risk and we always discuss the risk and benefits with our patient. Now, thankfully, these are very small. Even though it sounds scary because it's brain surgery, we always tell our patients the risk of something like bleeding or, or infection, that's something that you would have with any procedure. And the risk of this and, and this surgery with the way it's done is roughly one to 3%. So that means 97 to 99% of patients don't have those, um, those side effects or complications. So it's a very safe procedure. We know that through our studies and trials that's been around since the 90s. Um, remember, there's no cure for Parkinson's yet and um, central tremor as well, but we do have options to treat them. It's important to discuss with your team whether it's appropriate for you. And then one more example of uh, DBS. So this person says, DBS has empowered me to make a choice. If I want to work, I can work, but it's on my terms. Uh, it really is giving my life back. And again, this just underscores the frustration that essential tremor patients have when they don't have control over their symptoms any longer. So I hope, if anything, this has given you the opportunity to really take control back.